Welcome to the section on non-protein nit nitrogen compounds. Non-nitrogen compounds are traditionally used to monitor renal function. This term originated when the analytical methodology required the removal of protein from a sample before analysis. Luckily, nowadays, we don't have to do this anymore because of the advent of really sophisticated equipment. Um, what they used to do was take the concentration of those nitrogen-containing compounds and they would quantify it spectrophotometrically by converting nitrogen to ammonia. The subsequent reaction with Nessler's reagent produced a yellow color. Nowadays, the NPN fraction comprises about 15 components of clinical interest. The ones that we are going to talk about and the ones in the biggest um, majority are urea, ammonia, creatinine, creatine, and uric acid. Those are the ones we're going to talk about today. The majority of them arise from the catabolism of proteins and nucleic acids. First, we're going to talk about urea. Urea is the MPN compound that's in the highest concentration in the blood. It is a major excretory product of protein metabolism. It's formed in the liver from amino acids and free ammonia. Nitrogen is released as a result of protein and amino acid catabolism converted to urea and excreted as a waste product. After synthesis in the liver, urea is carried in the blood to the kidneys and filtered out. In essence, what happens is you eat, let's say you go and you eat a big steak or something um, protein related. In your body, in your intestines, these are broken down into amino acids. Those amino acids make it to your liver where they are stored or turned into something else. Once they are used, or they're no longer needed, or there's too many, the amino groups that you see connected, oops, let me go back here, um, connected down here, um, break off, okay? And those are turned, packaged into urea in your liver, okay? Now, urea is not extremely toxic, definitely not as toxic as ammonia. And it makes its way down to your kidneys and it is filtered out in the urine. So it is a waste product of having excess protein or excess amino acids present. What we do is we use this to evaluate their renal function, hydration status, their nitrogen balance or how much protein they have um, eaten and are using per se, adequacy of dialysis that they may be on, um, if it's somebody in kidney failure who's on renal dialysis. If for some reason their kidneys are not working, urea will build up in their bloodstream because that is the only way urea can be excreted. Some of the methods that we use um, are used, called an enzymatic urease method, um, sometimes called the Berthelot method, the glutamate dehydrogenase method, um, the furon or the diazine method. Here's a picture of what happens in the assay um, when you run this test uh, with an analyzer. The urea in the blood in two molecules of water in the presence of urease, which is the reagent, produces two ammonium and two carboxyl units. The ammonium plus some oxoglutarate with um, another enzyme create um, a glutamate and water. We are then testing for the glutamate dehydrogenase, or the glutamate and water in the end. So there is a couple enzymatic reactions that are occurring in that test tube. Some of the uh, requirements that we need are interfering substances for this. We use either plasma serum or urine. We want to avoid ammonium ions and high citrate and fluoride types of samples. So pretty much just a green top or a red top tube or urine container. We have to be careful because um, bacteria can decompose our urea, so we need to chill it or use it quickly. Reference range for this would be um, in serum 6 to 20 milligrams per deciliter is what we use more often than millimoles. Um, in urine, 12 to 20. And some of the terms that you need to be familiar with with urea are the following. Azotemia just refers to having an elevated concentration of urea in the blood. Uremia is a very high plasma urea concentration, which includes renal failure. Then we have pre-renal, renal, and post-renal azotemia. You need to be familiar with the differences. Pre-renal azotemia is something caused by redu reduced renal blood flow, low blood pressure, something like that. Something's wrong before the plasma reaches the kidney. Having a renal azotemia means that you have decreased renal function or renal failure 
and a post-renal azotemia is usually caused by an obstruction to the urine flow, something like a kidney stone. The next NPN I will mention is uric acid. Uric acid is a product of the pure, uh, catabolism of purine nucleic acids, which would be something like what DNA would be made up of. Most of it's reabsorbed in the proximal tubules and can be reused, but it's not really, it's pretty insoluble in plasma, which means it doesn't float it through the plasma real well. And at very high concentrations and um, certain pHs, it is deposited in the joints and tissues causing very painful inflammation called gout. And we'll get to that a little bit more in a minute here. So what happens is the purines are converted to uric acid in the liver. It's usually transported to the kidneys and filtered out by the glomerulus. And 70% of that's usually excreted. The remainder passes into the GI, GI tract and is degraded by bacterial enzymes there. The reason we may do a uric acid on a patient would be to assess inherited disorders of purine metabolism, confirmation of diagnosis and monitoring of gout, which I just talked about, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, assistance of the diagnosis of renal calculi, which is a kidney stone. What kind of kidney stone? They want to know what causes the kidney stone so that they can help prevent more of them in the future. The prevention of uric acid nephropathy, which is kidney issues in people that are undergoing chemotherapy for cancer. In detection of kidney dysfunction. So if the kidneys aren't working, you may have an elevated uric acid in your bloodstream. We use um, what's called the caraway method or uricase method in this case. Specimen requirements are very similar to the other NPNs. We could use a green top, a red top, or do it on urine. We want to remove the serum from the cells quickly. And um, diet can affect the concentration, but fasting usually isn't necessary. Normal here for a male is 3.5 to 7.2, and a female a little bit lower at 2.6 to 6.0. Children are even lower yet. Here's a picture of gout that I was talking about. This person has those uric acid crystals deposited in their, um, their joints. Obviously, this, this one got quite severe. Hopefully, you would seek some treatment before it would get to this point. Um, but a couple terms to be familiar with. Hyperuricemia is the elevated level of uric acid. This is what can lead to gout. Uh, the most common form of crystals in those um, joints that you can see is monosodium urate crystals. The reason they occur is because they're insoluble at the pH of plasma. When, um, if, if you have more than 6.4 milligrams per deciliter of uric acid, that's when you start to find some of the gout issues. Crystals will form in urine at a low pH as well. We find it um, increased catabolism of nucleic acids will cause it to be high, increased metabolism of cell nuclei, so if there's like a high cell turnover going on, uh, renal disease, and megaloblastic anemia. Now on the other side of the spectrum, we have hypouricemia. Hypouricemia can be found in things like liver disease, defective tubular resorption, and chemotherapy. Our next ones are creatinine and creatine. They are not to be confused, okay? While creatinine is formed from creatine and creatine phosphate in the muscle, they are not the same, okay? Creatine, when is a muscle source for the, or a energy source for the muscles, and the waste product of that when combined with creatine phosphate becomes creatinine. So, Plasma creatinine is inversely related to glomerular filtration rate. If you have a high creatinine in your bloodstream, it means that your kidneys are not working well and are um, not able to filter out the creatinine, kind of like urea. But we find that creatinine is actually a better test for glomerular filtration rate or how well the kidneys are um, able to filter, this, filter things out. So the physiology behind this is that creatine is synthesized from the liver by a couple amino acids you see listed there. It's then transported to other tissues and converted to creatinine phosphate, which serves as a high energy source. So your muscles need energy, right? As you can see in the top right hand side of the slide here, I do have one of those big jugs of creatine that you might see in a GNC store window. So creatine phosphate and creatine form creatinine which diffuses into the plasma and is excreted in the urine. So the clinical application of this is to see um, the severity of kidney or 
see the sufficiency of kidney function and the severity of kidney damage if there is some. We also use it to monitor the progression of kidney disease. We do this by a test called creatinine clearance. A creatinine clearance measures the amount of creatinine eliminated from the body by the kidneys. The clearance is defined as the volume of plasma by which a measured amount of substance can be completely eliminated into the urine per unit of time. Here is the calculation you need to be familiar with. You take the urine creatinine times the amount of mils per minute divided by the plasma creatinine. You multiply it by 1.73 divided by the body surface area. We are going to do an example here in a minute. Our normal range is 97 to 137 mils per minute for a male or 88 to 128 mils per minute for a female. When we do this, it gives us a glomerular filtration rate, which is the volume of plasma filtered in the glomerulus per unit of time, which is where we get the mils per minute from. So let's do an example. You have a patient um, who collects urine for 24 hours in a large container. Let's say the large container has 1,200 mils of urine in it. They collected that urine for 24 hours. When they came to the lab with their, um, sometime during their collection time, you drew their blood and their plasma creatinine was 1.5 milligrams per deciliter. You take a small aliquot or a portion of that 1,200 mils and tested it on the chemistry analyzer and you got 200 milligrams per deciliter. His body surface area, which you calculated using an online body surface area calculator, was 2.15. Let's plug this in the calculation below. First thing you do is take the urine creatinine here. You multiply it by the total volume, 1,200, always divided by 1,440. 1,440 is how many minutes are in 24 hours. Since we need our answer to be in mils per minute, we need to divide our 24-hour collection volume by how many minutes are in 24 hours. We then divide it by the plasma creatinine, which was 1.5, multiply it by 1.73, and then divide it by the body surface area of 2.15. When you plug this wonderfulness in your calculator, you will get 89 mils per minute. You will have three or four sample calculations to do on your, the end, or on your week five assignment. Um, make sure that you're not getting crazy answers. Your answers should be anywhere from five up to a couple hundred. If you're getting answers in the hundreds of thousands or in the ten thousands um, or point zero 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 two, you know you're not doing it right. Okay. Um, to be compatible with life, it's probably somewhere between five and two hundred and five or something like that. So some of the methods that we use uh, very important to memorize that the Jaffe reaction or the kinetic Jaffe reaction, is typically what is used to test for creatinine. Again, just like the other NPNs, we can use plasma serum or urine. We want to avoid hemolyzed and icteric samples. Icteric samples are really dark orange, usually caused by something like high bilirubin, which can be caused from liver failure. We'll talk about that in future chapters. Um, you need to, can be refrigerated for four days or freeze it if you need it longer. We need to be careful because things like ascorbate, which is a high um, concentrations of vitamin C, or glucose, alpha keto acids, uric acids, um, can increase creatinine concentration measured by the Jaffe, so it could cause a false increase. Uh, bilirubin can cause that negative bias because of the icteric sample. And um, patients' use of cephalosporin antibiotics, dopamine, and lidocaine can cause problems too. So what's normal? Well, for a male, it is 0 0.9 to 1.3, and for a female, 0 0.6 to 1.1. It is fairly dependent on the amount of muscle mass in a person. Men have more muscle, so their creatinines are going to be a little higher. Female have less, theirs will be a little bit lower. Usually, we see this increased with abnormal renal function. And when the plasma creatinine is elevated, the glomerular filtration rate is decreased, indicating renal damage. Creatine, on the other hand, is an elevated concentration associated with muscle disease, such as muscular dystrophy, poliomyelitis, hyperthyroidism, or trauma. It is not elevated in renal disease. It's very important to know the difference. Creatinines are run all the time. Okay, you get, sta you get a stat creatinine in the lab frequently. 
um, one of the cases that I had happen was there was a patient who needed to go to CAT scan. And before they inject those really heavy dyes into the patient's bloodstream that they may use for a CAT scan, they want to make sure somebody's kidneys are working appropriately so they're able to eliminate those heavy radiographic dyes um, afterwards. So the nurse calls me and says, I need a stat cre creatine. I said, no, we can do stat creatinine. She goes, no, the doctor wants a stat, stat creatine. She goes, how long is that going to take? I said, well, it's probably going to take about a week because we need to send it to Mayo Clinic and they're going to test it there and then get it back because it's not something that we do very often. She's like, no, we need this done right now. He's going to CAT scan. And I said, well, no, you need a creatinine. And the nurse goes, no, it says creatine here. So, of course, we had to clarify with the physician it was, in case, it was indeed a creatinine. So really don't get these confused. If a nurse were to order the creatine and we got that sample, we'd be sending it to Mayo Clinic and the patient would be waiting forever. So very important that you um, distinguish these things correctly. The last one is ammonia. This is formed in the deamination of amino acids during protein metabolism. It's removed from circulation and converted to urea in the liver. Remember we talked about urea first? I probably should have flipped that and talked about ammonia first. So when you have um, um, an excess of amino acids, it, they are turned into, broken down into free ammonia. Well, it can be converted to urea in the liver safely and packaged up and sent through your, your kidneys. But if your liver doesn't work and you have liver failure, you're not going to be able to convert that ammonia to urea and it builds up in your, in your bloodstream and becomes toxic. Um, it's usually produced in the catabolism of those amino acids, etc. Some results from um, anaerobic metabolic reactions in muscle during exercise, and it's excreted as ammonium ion in the kidney. So you can excrete a little bit of it, but it's more efficient to package it into urea, eliminate it that way. So I have a picture of ammonia here, and ammonia is ammonia, whether it's in your bloodstream or it's in a jug. So as you can imagine, it's toxic to have that floating around. We use this to determine severe liver disease. If somebody has a high ammonia, it means they've got severe liver disease. Can also be used for the prognosis of Reye's syndrome, which is associated with the ingestion of aspirin with a fever. We'll talk about that more later on as well. Sometimes if you have an inherited deficiency of urea cycle enzymes, it can cause increased ammonia. And we can use it to monitor hyperalimentation therapy, which is giving um, someone tube feeding. We're not going to worry too much about the methods down here, um, but it's a two-step approach. Some of the specimen requirements, very, 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 very important. Venous blood should be obtained and put on ice immediately. You can use a green top or actually a purple top in this case as well. We need to centrifuge the specimen really quickly within 20 minutes, keeping it cold, and take that plasma off the serum. What happens over time is those cells kind of start to die and release ammonia, and we end up with... Um, a higher ammonia than what we, the patient really has. So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure it's accurate. If somebody smokes a lot, um, or if there's urine in your sample, which would be kind of weird if you're doing a blood sample, um, ammonia and the detergents used to wash the glassware, reagents, etc., cetera, um, could cause a source of error. A normal is 19 to 60 micrograms per deciliter, so it's a very tiny amount. Um, in a child, you see it can be a little bit higher. Uh, we find it, again, increased in liver disease, encephalopathy, or deficiency, inherited deficiency of urea cycle enzymes. That concludes our section on NPNs.